Yakuza Like a Dragon, the next entry in a long-running franchise that is near and dear to my heart. And here to talk about it with me is Scott Strickert, the localization producer for Yakuza Like a Dragon. How you doing, Scott? Good, man. How are you? I'm hanging in there. Um, so I have a ton of questions about this. So I'm gonna I'm gonna grill you on all of them because I want to know everything about Yakuza Like a Dragon. I have been keeping up with the Japanese release, but you know, of course, with the uh, localization comes a lot of different uh, nuances to the Western release. But for those who are either not familiar or haven't been keeping up with the Japanese release, can you give us a rundown of Yakuza Like a Dragon? So, right. So on uh, Yakuza 6, The Song of Life was the end of the arc of uh, Kazuma Kiryu, our previous protagonist. And so with um, Yakuza Like a Dragon, we're starting a brand new story with our brand new protagonist, Ichiban Kasuga. We've completely revamped the combat system into a bit more of a JRPG system. It's a turn-based battle system now. So uh, we're set in uh, Yokohama primarily versus Kamuro Show. So there's a whole bunch of new stuff happening as we kind of launch into this new a new turn for the series. It's, it's everything it is, everything about it's pretty, pretty new. Now, one of the things about the Yakuza franchise was people always ask, where do I start? It's it's such a such a deep history. And obviously now the whole franchise is on PS4, but uh, is this a good place to you uh, for people to start getting into Yakuza? Absolutely. It's a it's the beginning of a brand new story for Ichiban. Um, it's there's there's so obviously some stuff that connects to the previous games because um, you know it's it's a, it's one continuous story. But we're not in a position where we're going to be saying, "Hey, man, you need to pay play like 200 hours of previous gameplay to understand this one interaction kind of thing." You know, so that's very much symbolized by our by our kind of name change with from the Japanese version to Yakuza Like a Dragon. We feel it's a hugely perfect spot for jumping into the series if you've never played it before. So a lot of us have a very strong attachment to Cosmo Kiryu, uh, but uh, like, like, yeah, uh, and like you've said, we've we've kind of closed the book on his story. Um, but what can you tell us about Kasuga Ichiban? He's almost the polar opposite. Is that fair to say? That's really fair to say. Yeah, he he, you know, Cosmo Kiryu, where it just keeps his emotions in check. You know, is very stoic. He he it has that same like um, they both share like a, a kind of curiosity about the world. And that's what gets them involved in all the hijinks they get into, right? But um, Ichiban wears his emotions on his sleeve. He says what he thinks. He um, he's he's very charismatic. He's he's outgoing. There's there's there is a kind of a polar opposite kind of shift that's happening for Ichiban from as you compare him to Kiryu. Now, when you're trying to kind of uh, characterize him through localization, uh, there's obviously that that's the bulk of the work that you and your team have to do. But what can you tell us about uh, what it's like to kind of localize his personality for the Western release? Like, what are some of the nuances that you do? What are some of the characterizations that you make specifically for him to kind of get that personality across? Right, so Ichiban has, um, compared compared to Kiryu at least, he's, he's more of a, I guess you could see he's a little more street. He grew up on the in, on the fringes of society, much like Kiryu, but also in in kind of he was born in a soapland. He was born in a and and raised in in Shangri La, the famous soapland that's been in the series forever. And as a result, he's a little bit more casual speaking. He um he, I wouldn't say he dips into like the what we typically characterize as like the Kansai accent, but there's definitely a little bit more of like the fast talking, easygoing kind of nature about his 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 speech patterns that uh, weren't present in previous protagonists. We're talking about localization, but to pivot back for just a minute, like for those who may not understand uh, what localization is, uh, how would you explain it to them uh, as the difference between translation and localization? A translation would be um, something that is as as true to the written word as could possibly be be had. And I, um, you know, we, we get really into like translation philosophy. You know, you can you can basically translate the same sentence in any from any source language to a target language six different ways, and it would all be accurate. For a localization, I think the requirement is simply that the experience be carried over from a in our case a Japanese user's experience to a Western user's experience. We're trying to mirror the same amount of you know, humor and drama that you would have experienced had you been able to play and understand the game in Japanese. And that's where a localization takes a translation to the next level because we're conveying an experience more so than just words. A lot of that shows through in sort of the, the humor, I guess. Uh, I know that the Yakuza franchise is of course very uh, well known for its how it uses humor to kind of build its world and its characters. But with Yakuza Like a Dragon, what can you tell me about the level of absurdity 
that you're leaning into because uh, from the gameplay that we've seen uh, that some folks are looking at right now, uh, <laughs> this game ratchets up the absurdity quite a bit. And that's right? saying a lot. That's saying a lot. So uh, <laughs> what, what's it like to work with that kind of level of uh, that level of humor and absurdity? I think, you know, from, from to answer your first question, I mean, from a like how much humor and absurdity is in the game, you know, obviously we, our main story is still very dramatic and like heavy at times and criminal underworld, like all that stuff happening. But the, you know, when you look at like where the Yakuza series kind of lives, right? Where you, on one side of that, like ultimate kind of craziness, you've got Yakuza Zero. And then on the other kind of more serious, more, more introspective type, you've got more like Yakuza 6. This one definitely skews more toward that Yakuza Zero level of like zany and crazy. And personally, I love that about it. I love working on the humorous type stuff just because I think, um, I don't know, it's just a personal philosophy that video games can and should be funny. Like that's just like, you don't want to sit down and get like bummer town, right? Like there's a, lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of things about games that just are lend themselves to humor and being able to work in a world that is so humorous and really kind of twist on a dime you know like that's that's one of my favorite things about the series yeah yeah it's it it, almost, it feels very natural to at least from my experience with the yakuza franchise um and also one of my uh, other favorite features of the franchise are sub stories um can you tell me a little bit about the sort of sub stories that we're going to get involved with here and tell me about your favorite sub sub story that you've oh, seen so far Oh Come on, you got, you got to tell me, man. Right? So there's there's like, there's like there's another 50 of them. They're, they're basically all set in Yokohama this time. Um, I think the sub-stories are definitely where the, the the level gets amped, you know, on the crazy. There's still, of course, like the heartwarming sub-stories. There's a lot of things that really, like, set Ichiban apart, you know, from and really you learn a bit about his history through them, but um, a lot of them are just nuts. Like, there's one where um, he is... This, this sickly girl is looking at a persimmon tree and says, you know, she says, when this persimmon falls from the tree, I think that's going to be my last day on this earth. And he's like, never. And so he goes through like this multiple <laughs> stages of protecting this persimmon tree from like various, he protects it from a sumo wrestler who's using it for practice. And then this, this sniper is like shooting at the persimmon for practice. And he's just like, <laughs> he's, doing, he's going to all, all, all ends to make sure this persimmon never falls from the tree. And it's it's really cute and fun, and that's that's just one that came to the top of my head. But there are so many good ones. Oh yeah, it's, I don't doubt it, man. Uh, it's, it's definitely one of the one of the highlights of the series. I think it's it's an opportunity for the characters to kind of uh, to kind of show who they are, uh, and it helps like make the world feel like it's lived in. And I think going off of that too is that over time we've seen the franchise be more and more representative of different groups of people uh particularly like lgbtq lgbtq representation um what can you tell me about that uh with like a dragon if uh if it goes to those lengths to kind of um like push the envelope in terms of representation i mean it's still set in asia it's still set in a world where um you know we don't and we don't take that out of that for sure you know it's mm -hmm. it's in set in japan and, and it deals with people who live on the margins of that society um you know in this time we are dealing with um a three faction kind of war between japanese korean uh chinese and um that's that's another aspect of i guess representation is asian representation just to make sure, sure. that that's mm -hmm. you know because i think that that's that's also important um i can't think of any specific other like ways that this is like pushing the envelope but you will definitely be talking a lot about like i said people who live on the margins and that's you know ichiban from from his soap land born kind of things and a lot of things having to do with the circumstances of his birth um they deal heavily with uh the politics of um brothels and prostitution and what that's like mm -hmm. for those those women um living and working in that world and you know those those are things that our story um and the franchise in general continues to explore in ways that are both realistic and also kind of um, hopefully pushing forward that envelope a little bit to explore those themes. Now, when you go from like Kamurocho is almost its own character that, you know, when you jump into the game, you get an immediate sense of where you are uh, because it's modeled so heavily after uh, Kabukicho Red Light District and it's just neon lights and so many things happening on the street. How are you characterizing, or how hard is it to pivot to Yokohama and trying to characterize that place as opposed to Kamurocho? It's it's crazy because um, Yokohama is like three times the size of Kamurocho in the game, mm -hmm. and uh, it's split into what I I think it's seven districts of like you know you've got like uptown, lowtown, um, 
K-Town, Chinatown, and like Hamakita Park is in there. Like all these pl real places, of course, are mixed in. And you really get a, a vibe for each little community inside of that area that as you're kind of traveling, you can see the, the architecture change. You can see the NPCs change. You can see it so much about, you know, just crossing the street makes you feel like you're almost kind of traveling to another section of a town. And it, I think that com comes across really, really well. And it, it, you know, it doesn't throw you at the whole whole map and say, go, you know, it definitely gates it a little bit and yeah. you know, it makes you kind of learn each little each little hub before you kind of move to the next and and, under, and then you really get this overarching picture of, of this, just this incredible diversity that's in Yokohama. And I'm assuming that uh, Yokohama is going to be filled with tons of mini games too. Uh, <laughs> what can you tell me about mini games? And as a second question to follow up to that, are we going to have karaoke? Yes, there is karaoke. There's yes. mad karaoke. It's um, each each character has their own song um, because it's a party based game this time. So super fun. Uh, <laughs> you're going to look forward to that. Um, but mini games are off the hook this time. Um, <laughs> As if they weren't already. I know. Um, we've got uh, Dragon Kart, which is a full on like, um, you know, streets of Tokyo racing mini game. Um, you know, you can shoot rocket launchers and hit power boosts and all that kind of stuff. Uh, with very popular game, I'm sure you know. Um, <laughs> and then there's this other mini game. One of my favorites is that Ichiban goes into a classic movie theater, which is just so comfortable that he starts falling asleep. And you have to like, it's almost like a rhythm game where you have to punch away the rim rams to like make him stop falling asleep. And <laughs> yeah. they're, they're like casting their magic spells on him to like cast him, make him fall asleep. So <laughs> it's hilarious and awesome. <laughs> oh man. So uh, uh, one thing that I think the localization team talks about a lot is, or at least the, the thing that stands out to me when the localization team talks about what they do is kind of JPCs and just how heavy it is to just go through a, a huge script and localize that, and translate and localize and edit that. Um, and also making UI elements work uh, when they get translated or localized. Uh, so one, how many JPCs are there in, in Like a Dragon? <laughs> uh, can you explain what that is? And then also, are there any particular challenges when it comes to making, because this is an RPG? Um, for the record, this game this game was not supposed was scoped when we initially talk, started talking about it like last year. I've been working on this game for over a year at this point. Uh -huh. For a lot less JPCs than the game ended up being, a JPC is a Japanese character, a single emoji, a single word that can often account for a single character that can often account for an entire English word, right? So, um, or you know, one or two generally equals an English word. But that's semantics. Um, the this game ended up being closer to 1.2, 1.3 million JPC, which is about the size of Yakuza Zero. And that's uh, wild. <laughs> <laughs> Yakuza 5 remains like the biggest and most monstrous uh, game that we've ever had to encounter. But this one is, is a very, very massive game. Lots of text. Yeah. Um, what was the second part of your question? Sorry. Oh, uh, if, there's <laughs> anything, if there's anything particular about uh, localizing an RPG, as opposed to uh, like, are there UI elements that present different types of challenges? Yeah, it yeah. Okay. Um, it's, you know, there's a lot of like, um, like battle UI that is kind of like, you know, attack, defend, that kind of stuff that all kind of came into play. A lot of the, the heat actions use an entirely new kind of interface. Um, the, um, and then of course there's, there's just still tons of graphic text, you know, like they, um, all the, all the, the enemy, Things that pop up on the screen, that kind of stuff, and mm -hmm. we're always trying to make sure that that's as playful and as interesting as it can be. There's a lot of um, like uh, when the, when they, when something happens in battle, like it'll be like you know this character taunts you, like that would be like the general kind of Japanese translation is you know you were taunted by this guy, but we give it that yakuza flavor and he's like starts mad dogging you kind of thing. You know, it's like there's a lot of that like uh, taking what what yakuza is about and transferring that into a JRPG and really merging those worlds. This, this is a question for a lot of uh, folks out there when it comes to Western versions of Japanese games is how much freedom do you have when you do the localization? Uh, we've had conversations about this before, but for the folks who may not be uh, familiar with those conversations, uh, can you explain a little bit about how, how much your team has uh, the freedom to kind of make the game their own, even though this, this has already been out in Japan? We're the, the team trusts us implicitly. And when um, when something comes up that we're like, ah, oh, this this would be really cool if we could do this, it automatically like I have weekly calls with those guys. I'm talking to them on a weekly basis. And 
uh, during throughout when we've been doing that for a year, right? So like I've been talking to them about things that are like, well, you know, this is going to be really difficult for us, or this is this will be something that you know I want you guys to consider when you're making the game is to make sure that you know this is something that you can stand behind as a localization choice because you know we're going to be as accurate and as true to this as possible. So what do you feel like? You know, it, when we have to translate it this way, how do you, how does that make you feel as a team, right? So there's a lot of, there's a lot of back and forth with them because um, not, it's not, it's not like a, we do our game, then you do our game. And I think a lot of, you know, the internet idea is that, well, the localization team is just out there ruining it by putting their own spin on it. And it's like, no, that's not the case. We're literally talking to the team about that, getting sign off on everything, talking them through it and coming up with a way that makes it work in the West as well as it did in Japan to again, convey that experience that a Japanese player would have had. I guess another thing that people are probably wondering about or are a little iffy on is the general direction towards an RPG because uh, like if you're familiar, if folks are familiar, Yakuza has always been this like 3D kind of brawler type of game. Uh, but the transition to RPG, I mean, we've all seen the gameplay at this point and uh, we kind of know how that flows almost like a dragon quest um, <laughs> as as kazuga ichiban is a big fan of himself uh in lore uh, but uh, what would you what would you say to those who are who are kind of on the fence about this new approach i think um the team has really done an incredible job of making sure that the game the jrpg gameplay is just as snappy and cool looking as though it were an action game they really transferred the, the experience of that action game and distilled it down to a, a turn-based jrpg which makes it i guess a little more accessible like there's a lot of people i think in the past that were like oh it's an action game i can't i can't mash the buttons hit the do things right and that this not only does that open it up to a new audience but i think the fans who you're talking about you know i understand the skepticism you know when we're talking about the change i think that it's both like something that was on the you know when we did the april fool's joke right and it was yeah. like oh, you know, everyone was like oh i totally play that and then like wait you actually <laughs> did it <laughs> um but the the you know the interest level has been high i think it's you definitely have to give it a shot it, there's a lot of ways that we've maintained an action oriented system in this jrpg thing it's so snappy it's so it's so fun and interesting and even if you're not like the biggest jrpg fan if you're still a yakuza fan it's still going to have a lot of appeal for you yeah, I know. Going back to the April Fool's joke, everyone, I was, I was like, I'm a huge Persona fan, so I'm like, yo, what if, what if I can have a Yakuza game that plays like Persona? Uh, and I was like, ah, oh, they, wait, they would never do that. They got, they, they got it made with, with the uh, Yakuza formula. Yeah, everyone was like, it's gonna be, it's gonna be a mini game. We're like, no, nah, it's the whole game, guys. <laughs> uh, so that, that's really exciting, man. Uh, I know a few folks who have already been playing the Japanese version, but I'm holding out uh, till it comes out. And what, what can you tell us about release date so far? We're, we're day and date with the uh, Xbox Series X hardware. Whenever they decide to announce that day, we'll be there um, on Xbox Series X, PlayStation 4, Steam, Windows 10, and PlayStation 4, of course. Cool. Appreciate the work, you, the work that you do and appreciate you taking the time to talk to us about Always Yakuza. a pleasure, man. Yeah. Hey, Scott, take care, man. You too. So that's Yakuza Like a Dragon. It's coming out later this year, so keep your eyes peeled for that because Kasuga Ichiban has a story to tell us. And stick with us here at GameSpot because we have so many more developer interviews and exclusive gameplay for Play For All. And don't forget to donate to the causes that we are supporting. Links are in this, the description below. And we'll see you next time.